The first election under the 1973 Home Rule Act was held November 1974. This year, we commemorate the 40th anniversary of Home Rule in a series of panel discussions that covers the history of the District of Columbia, the various governance structure in the district, and specifically the past four decades of electoral government in the District of Columbia. Today, we have convened a panel of distinguished historians who will provide the historical foundation of governance in the nation's capital, modification in the city charter, the role of slavery and African Americans in the suffrage movement, and in later years, the struggle for voting rights, amendment, and statehood. Joining us are C.R. Gibbs, author, lecturer, historian. George Derrick Musgrove, Professor of History, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And Dr. Bernard Demchek, Professor of History, George Washington University. As early as 1790, there were discussions and provision for the federal district along what we call today the Potomac River. The provision of 1790 played an important role in determining the location of the capital. As a result of dinner conversation between Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, while in New York, this discussion led towards the location of the nation's capital. Think of it, if you will, as a, as a vexatious problem. You, you have squabbling parties. The northern states did not want the capital in a southern location and vice versa. Ultimately, the compromise would revolve around uh, the assumption of northern debt uh, by everyone if, on the other hand, the nation's capital could be placed in a southern location. The Residence Act itself uh, allows the capital to be put somewhere between the eastern branch and the, and here we go again, the De my Delaware Indian is not way it, as good as it should be, but the Conococheague River and Washington will send survey teams to determine exactly where in that expanse the new capital will be. Dr. Dimchek, what is the constitutional provision that gives Congress jurisdiction over the district and what are the limitations uh, of this provision? Well, the constitutional provision was Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution that gave the federal government complete powers and jurisdiction over this territory called the District of Columbia. Um, that that was, a, was also, in a sense, a compromise because there was a question as to how a, a government, a, a local, uh, our national capital would be governed itself. And, and by this, this um, article, it permitted the federal government to have complete jurisdiction over this new place called the District of Columbia, a 10 square mile place carved out of, of slave plantations in Maryland and Virginia. What is the significance of the Residence Act of 1790? Well, the Residence Act really was an, uh, um, 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 an act by Congress that gave the authority to the President of the United States to find the exact location that uh, Professor Gibbs was talking about. And that location, he, he liked the Potomac River. He liked the Potomac River watershed. He, he lived in this area. Obviously, he was at Mount Vernon. And he surveyed, he came down and surveyed the Potomac River Basin. And he went up to Great Falls and he realized that you can't put a, 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 a nation's capital uh, over, over um, above the falls. He had a fall line. The fall line, you know, you, where we see Georgetown University is up on a hill. That was part of the fall line. We're down below the fall line where the, um, where the present White House exists. And so the President of the United States had the authority to place this new District of Columbia in the Potomac Basin. He, of course, chose, chose a place that would be convenient for his house, uh, which was part of the reason it was here. But really, it was because of this compromise that Professor Gibbs was talking about between the North and the South. Slavery is still raging at this time. And uh, the question, and, and, and of course, he saw Alexandria and Georgetown as deep water ports. And so the port of Georgetown, the port of Alexandria, were tobacco, 
uh, uh, commodity ports, trading in both slaves and tobacco, and that was an ideal place for the new, um, the new seat of government. Dr. Gibbs, you've researched and published a plethora of history on the governance of the district and the role of the black community. What kind of self-help effort occurred in the black community during the pre and post Civil War period? I think those periods are marked by a, a great deal of self-reliance. We see individuals who are uh, uh, behind the founding of churches, who are at least prior to the Civil War for free blacks, the establishment of schools, and the also the beginning of uh, African-American self-help societies such as the Resolute Beneficial Association. If, if the city would not help you, if you could not get insurance, if the, the place where you were going to be buried was uncertain, free blacks and, and enslaved blacks, to the extent that they could, came together and worked for a better society and a better uh, uh, attempt at life. I, I recall that in the journey through the seaboard uh, slave states, uh, the author talks about how the, the, the police broke up a meeting a perfectly peaceful meeting of uh, free and enslaved African Americans. And what they found were papers, a Bible, uh, and, and a sign-up sheet, if you will, for the freeing of a young woman named Eliza Howard, who they hoped to be able to collect enough money to free her. These are the kinds of activities that spanned faith and, and the civil sector that uh, free and enslaved blacks were involved in. Uh, before and just after the Civil War. Mr. Davis, this is, this is an important point because we, we, we are all very proud of ourselves in Washington, D.C. as being the black mecca of America, Howard University, and this amazing African-American middle class and professional class we have, but it starts right there in the beginning of free African-Americans uh, in this place where they are stuck between two major slave states, Virginia and Maryland, yet in 1800, early on, African Americans are getting free in many different ways, by hook or by crook, and they're freeing other people. And so what we find at, what we see, Washington, D.C. becomes one of the freest communities in America, as well as one of the leaders in helping the rest of America get free. Professor Demchek, yes. what was the impact of the Nat Turner Rebellion of 1831 and the Snow Riot of 1835 on the race relation in the city? Well, you know, Nat Turner in Southampton, Virginia in 1831 um, uh, comes about at a period of time what we refer to as the Second Great Awakening in African American history where African Americans are organizing themselves into churches and organizing themselves into self-help movements and organizing themselves in opportunities to get themselves free out of slavery. His rebellion was a very bloody rebellion. It was put down, he eventually was caught and, and tried and hung, but the rebellion struck fear through America's hearts. It struck fear through white um, slave masters uh, um, consciousness and it created a, a sense of, of very serious tension among um, African Americans and whites all through America and particularly in Washington DC and in 1835 Beverly Snow owned the Epicurean Oyster House at the corner of 7th and Pennsylvania he had a very legitimate business he was a free black man he was doing a very good business and as a matter of fact he um, was part of the abolition community and people suspected him of being yet another Nat Turner. And they destroyed his business. The uh, white people rioted and uh, attacked him and virtually ran him out of town. It was a very tense period. In this whole period in the 1830s and 40s, African Americans are taking control of their own lives and trying to throw off slavery by any means necessary. Dr. Gibbs, following the Snow Ride of 1835, what impact did it have on the Compromise of 1850 and subsequently, the District of Columbia Compensated Emancipation Act of 1862. 
it's important for us to understand that we can connect these, these events, both legislative and the response to them. Uh, the 1850, essentially, for its impact on the district, ends slave trading, but not slave owning, mm -hmm. in the District of, of Columbia. It is a step forward, perhaps a timid step, uh, uh, when you compare to what was already happening in, for example, the British Empire, with, which had already abolished the slave trade in, in 1807 and would outlaw slavery and free its enslaved people uh, in 1834. So we, we look at the United States tiptoeing through uh, up to what is clearly becoming a self-evident conclusion that this institution of bondage and, and blood and death is not much longer. We, we, can't put a, we, we can't put a bet on how long it's going to take, but the end is in sight. And the end will come with the Compensated Emancipation Act of 1862. Uh, just like the freeing of enslaved people in the British Empire, they're gonna use a form of Compensated Emancipation in the British Empire. The district will use Compensated Emancipation in order to rid itself of what one publication called this, that, this evil that divides uh, the United States from the rest of the civilized world. As we look at this governance structure of the District of Columbia and celebrating uh, the 40th anniversary of uh, Home Rule under the 1973 uh, Home Rule Act, enlighten us on the territorial government. Was that an important uh, milestone in the history of the District of Columbia as it relates to the governance of the city? Oh, the, the, the charters of Georgetown and the district are basically tossed in the waste bin, and, and the district is declared a territory with a governor and a secretary and an elective body. And this is good news for African Americans in, in this town. Frederick Douglass has a brief flirtation with it. Uh, uh, his son is going to follow him. Uh, this is a chance even over and above what happened in the late 1860s to have a larger black presence on the, the, if you will, the city council. And we get incredibly accomplished men of mark. Uh, Solomon Brown, uh, who is a poet, uh, who has the, um, is the longest, the first black employee of the Smithsonian, and who has a memorial grave, memorial grove rather, uh, right outside of the Museum of Natural History. He is a man who is a scientist, a scholar, a poet, uh, author, and who worked with not only Joseph Henry, uh, a leader in the early Smithsonian, but also uh, with the uh, gentleman who, uh, Morse, with the uh, Telegraph. So we, we have wonderful individuals who bring together th this wonderful synthesis of skills that are allowed to flourish in that brief burst of political freedom known as the territorial government, because it's not going to last. And, 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 and in 1870, right before the territorial government of 1871, African-American men are granted the right to vote in the 15th Amendment. Um, 7,000 African-American men register to vote compared to only 1,000 white men registering to vote at that same time. So African-Americans are already, they're free, black men are free and then free to vote, and now you're beginning to build a political empowerment opportunity. Howard University is founded in 1867, and all of this is beginning to come about at the same time, and quite frankly, we're in the middle of reconstruction, and it's not gonna to last too long, but uh, it was a flurry of, of emancipated activity. Absolutely, and, and it's, re it's useful to consider that we're not going to have that kind of flexibility for a long time. Dr. Musgrove, what I'd like to do now is to shift. As we know that the, uh, after the uh, territorial government, we had the Board of Commissioners, which was the longest form of uh, governance in the, in the district. But I'd like to, uh, you to address, because you, you've conducted uh, much of your research uh, around uh, the Home Rule Act of 1974. Will you enlighten us on um, what occurred and after uh, 1974 and self-determination among the activists, and what did they achieve after, after uh, the Home Rule Act of 1974? Well, sure, to, to understand what folks attempted to do after 1974, it's helpful to understand how they got Home Rule in the first place. Uh, there had been efforts to try and create Home Rule in the district, uh, stretching all the way back to the pre-World War II period, and they were consistently blocked by segregationists in Congress. 
And the person who came to symbolize the effort to block home rule for the district was John McMillan, uh, a representative from South Carolina. Uh, and local activists, uh, Walter Fontroy, most prominent among them, organized in eight, uh, 1972 and again in 1974, pardon me, 1970 and 1972, to head down to his district and to uh, organize black voters for his opposition, whoever that was. Uh, and in 1970, it was an African American man. In 1972, it was a liberal uh, or, or more moderate uh, white man. They were able to defeat him. And when they did, Charlie Diggs, uh, African American congressman from Detroit, rose to the chair of the DC committee in the House. He then helped to draft home rule legislation. Uh, looking at that uh, example, many home rule activists, after home rule had been achieved, uh, attempted to go ahead and do something similar to get the next step, which was representation in Congress. Uh, they then pushed in 1976 and again in 1978 for a DC voting rights amendment. One of the aspects of the, the Home Rule Act uh, that uh, many activists were quite disappointed in is that uh, residents did not have any representation in Congress. And so after the city gets Home Rule, uh, some of the same activists who had secured uh, that legislation go on to try and get representation in Congress. That takes a legislative form in 18, 1976 and then again in 1978 of the DC Voting Rights Amendment. It's defeated in 76, uh, but many of the activists uh, who had backed it that year uh, begin working around the country, calling black voters in South Carolina, in Mississippi, in Arkansas, and asking them to call their senators and their congressmen to get them to vote for this legislation. Their efforts were so effective that Strom Thurmond, absolutely no friend of DC voting rights, gets down to the floor of the Senate in 1978 and says, I believe that we should support DC, the DC Voting Rights Amendment because the human rights matter, and he supports the legislation. And so that campaign is successful and the D.C. Voting Rights Amendment goes on to the states. Unfortunately, there it's defeated by some of the same folks that defeat the ERA. How did it pass the House and Senate, uh, considering the chamber historic hostility to D.C. self-determination? Uh, D.C. voting rights activists head into the different states uh, and organize voters to call their members of Congress and their members of the Senate uh, to get them to support this legislation. Uh, and just to give another example, um, James Eastland, longtime segregationist, would have had the opportunity as the chair of the Senate Judiciary to Committee to uh, have bottled up this legislation. Uh, takes a walk, uh, just basically doesn't uh, vote. Uh, and that allows the legislation to go to the floor and to pass. Uh, and the DC Voting Rights Amendment passes the Congress in 1978, heads out to the states for ratification, where unfortunately it dies. Why did it take a decade uh, between the statehood vote in 1980, <laughs> which authorized the city to elect a statehood delegation, and the election of statehood uh, delegation in 1990? So in, in 1980, there is a referendum in the city uh, uh, asking the residents if they want to have a statehood convention. Uh, and if they want to have a shadow delegation sent to Congress to lobby for statehood. Uh, the residents of the city vote for both. Uh, a constitutional convention is then put together, constitution is written, uh, and that would be for the 51st state if, in fact, it's passed through Congress. Um, at the same time, that, legis that uh, res um, referendum allowed the city to hold elections for a statehood delegation. These would be shadow senators and a shadow representative who would go to Congress and lobby for DC statehood. Um, and they didn't give many directions, uh, the, the, the uh, referendum didn't give any directions on what exactly these people's role would be. And a lot of local elected officials were uncomfortable uh, with having uh, elected officials without portfolio running around in the city. Uh, and so they simply didn't hold elections for 10 years. Uh, until in 1990, Jesse Jackson heads to town, teams up with Hilda Mason and a couple of other uh, statehood activists, and shames the council into holding statehood delegation elections. Uh, he then promptly joins uh, the contest and wins the shadow senator position. Professor Demchek, what happened to the statehood movement after 1993? And I'd like to get comments from uh, the other panelists as well on this question. 
Well, you know, in 1993, um, activists in the city, um, and I was certainly part of that movement, every Thursday afternoon at noon, mm -hmm. we marched from um, the city hall to the Longworth building and we poured tea in the middle of the street and we sat in the middle of the street and we waited and sat in the middle of the street and waited for Congress to vote on statehood. Um, it took us 21 weeks in a row to get arrested. Hundreds and hundreds of us got arrested in the process. And that movement, that action by people demanding the right to vote on statehood actually forced the United States House of Representatives to vote on statehood in 1993. Unfortunately, we lost the vote. Uh, I think we got 153 votes out of the uh, 435 votes. We got one Republican vote. God bless him, Congressman Wayne Gilchrist from mm. Maryland voted for us. And as a matter of fact, the Republican Party used that vote that he gave us to defeat him a few years later. But what happened was that finally our citizenry got angry enough to demand a vote in Congress. They voted, we lost, and once that happened, we went back to rest and to not agitate anymore. Mm -hmm. I firmly believe that we can get statehood if we get angry enough. I think, and Reverend Jesse Jackson said that our, 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 our ability to get statehood will come when we rise to the level of indignation like we did against slavery, like we did for civil rights. I think we have just enough little democracy in, in, in the city to keep us happy. Voting for mayor, voting for city council, but we need to be angry and we need to go all the way to vote for statehood and to get statehood. Dr. Gibbs, your, your comments on the 1993 statehood movement. and, and I, I, I love the idea of, of the statehood movement. Th this is an idea that is both old and new and, and shows at least some of the best ideas of, of, of activism that we can transport from what the kids might say is back in the day to now because this is still an unsettled uh, uh, undecided idea and unless we lobby for it, we continue to work for it following the excellent example of, of, of the tireless activism of Professor Demchuk and his cohorts who again I can't think of anything that, that seemingly would be uh, less invigorating than dumping tea and, and having the same result week after week after week. But it's clearly demonstrated that we're going to have to present a model for the young people because this is increasingly going to be a, a, a movement that, will, that must be picked up by the young people. And we've, we've got to show them the history of struggle. We've got to show them the battle over the, the non-voting delegate, a voting delegate, and, and, the, and the other components of statehood. Without that being done, we're going to have to redo much of this. Dr. Musgrove, closing remarks on the question of the 1993 vote on the D.C. statehood and why it failed. One of the main things that uh, caused the statehood forces problems after 1993 is that there's a Republican Revolution of 1994. Uh, there simply was not a receptive audience in Congress for the push. Um, and that was plain from all the folks who came in. They were on record as saying that they opposed statehood for the District of Columbia. Uh, so that really uh, didn't give much hope to folks here on the ground. Um, but I, I do think that, that my fellow panelists are correct in saying that, you know, the other side of it was that the forces here on the ground demobilized. Uh, Jesse Jackson left town in 1995 and focused on uh, uh, things back in Chicago. Um, and activists uh, really couldn't figure out a new strategy after 95-96 uh, for what exactly they wanted to do. Uh, and we've been, we've been in a holding pattern ever since. As we celebrate the 40th anniversary of Home Rule, Panelists, give me your thoughts about the future of home rule in the next five to 10 to 15 to 40 years. Dr. Gibbs. I think the future is, is to a large extent what we make it. And while we will be affected by the varying winds of political change, as long as we remain firmly fixed on the concept of statehood and that we understand that the, the home rule is okay, but it is a path, it is a step on the path to the road to self-government. It is not the end. We've got to take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. Dr. Musgrove. I think if there's anything that the history of home rule tells us, it's that uh, our democracy here in the District of Columbia is fragile. Uh, it has been given and it has been taken away. 
Uh, but the one way that it has been secured over the last 200 or so years is through the constant struggle of people here on the ground to make sure that they had a say in their own government. Uh, and as we look at 40 years of home rules, we celebrate 40 years of home rule, we should recognize that we still do not have statehood, we still do not have a say in Congress, and that needs to be fought for just as uh, our efforts to get some say in our government have been fought for in the past. Mm -hmm. Dr. Demchak. You know, uh, Mr. Davis, we are, we are, we DC residents are also American citizens. Uh, we're good enough to pay taxes to America. We're good enough to die in wars in America. We are larger than two other states in population. We pay more taxes per capita than 49 other states in the nation. Uh, we're also good enough, therefore, to have full 100% class citizenship in the District of Columbia. We want statehood. We don't want to wait another 40 years. And with statehood comes two senators and a voting member of Congress so we can be like all other Americans. And that's what really, we really want, to be like all other Americans. Panelists, I want to thank you so much for this uh, first series of uh, uh, discussions in the documentary on the 40th anniversary on Home Road. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.